morning and welcome to Speedway United Methodist Church, whether you're here in person or if you're watching on Facebook, we welcome you today. Um, Thursday night, um, Speedway um, UMC will be participating in the Town of Speedway Community Day. They're going to have it at Meadowood Park from 5 to 8 p.m. Um, our church will have a booth and so Sherry needs some help. So if you can help her at any time, um, please let her know. Uh, on behalf of the leadership team, I want to invite everybody to please come to our pitching next Sunday. Uh, we'll be doing that right after church. We'll be uh, sharing a meal with Casa de Dios, and this will be an opportunity to meet them again and spend time with Pastor G and Annetta. Um, if you can please bring a side dish, um, the main course, and uh, drinks will be provided. If you come and don't have um, something, please come anyway. Um, each two every two weeks, the card ministry team will be sending out new cards, and the cards this week will be for Linda Nylander, uh, Ben McCauley, and Elaine Griffith. Keep Elaine in your prayers. She will have surgery on Tuesday. Um, October 9th is Pastor Appreciation Sunday, and there will be a basket in the back for any cards and gifts. Um, anyone who volunteers or is paid to work with the children and um, venerable adults at our church or a work at any time in our church need to um, attend the yearly child and um, vulnerable adult abuse training. So if you need to take that, please see Sherry. She can give you the details, um, or you can email her with your name, address, and date of birth. Today's worship focus is the Lord protects those who know his name. So lovely. So lovely. 
of his eye. You are his chosen one. He has sent his son to die for you. And me too, by the way. Just to let you know, Jesus died for us. What great love that is. Amen. Somebody said, I asked him how much he loved me. And he stretched his arm to show me. How. Amen. God loves you. And because he loves us, because he first loved us, that's how we love him. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we want to express our love to you today. Tell of your goodness and your mercy and your kindness and all the blessings that you bestow upon us and how you care for us, God, even when we don't even care for ourselves. How you watch over us, God, even when we don't see the dangers. How you, oh God, are our God. And we're just in love with you, Lord. We're in love with you and your grace and your mercy and your kindness, your truthfulness. And God, all that you are to us, all that you do for us, God, most of all, we love you just because of who you are. We worship you because of who you are. You are the God, the creator, the awesome one, the magnificent one, the all-powerful, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. We worship you today and give you glory and praise and magnify your name. Above all that we see and above all, oh God, that's going on in our world, you're the God who sits on the throne. You're the God who sits high and looks low. You're the God of compassion and love. Oh, how we love you, Jesus. We love you, oh God. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for, oh God, sending your son to die for us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the sacrifice of your blood. We thank you for redemption and salvation and grace, truth and mercy. We thank you, oh God, for the blessing of gathering together for worship. For those of all oh God who are online this morning, we thank you for worship, for worshiping God, your name, and having a mind, oh God, to think on you this morning. We bless your name and we give you glory. 
We ask that your Holy Spirit would fill us this day, O oh God, by your power. Let your anointing flow in the service. Let it move, O oh God, about those who are over the airways. Let your power, the power and the love of Christ, minister to us, God, as it has never ministered to us before. May your grace and glory, O oh God, look on Elaine this morning. And, O oh God, as we stand with her and stand for her, Father, we just pray your, your hand of protection over her life. We pray your grace. We pray your will, oh God. We pray, Lord, that you would embrace her with your love and your kindness upon Ron this morning, God, that your touch would be upon him, that the power of the Holy Spirit would be upon him to break every yoke, oh God, to heal and deliver, to restore, oh God, all that's been lost, all that's been stolen. We pray for little Memphis Riley Hospital, Father pneumonia in his lungs and so much going on in his little body. We pray the Holy Spirit give grace and wisdom to doctors and nurses. God, give a spirit of compassion and love. Lord, let your healing grace be upon them. We ask this in the name of Christ. As we worship you this morning, not only just God with words, but as we worship you in giving, we bless the offering this morning those who are giving online, as well as those who are in the sanctuary, as those who gave on their way in. Father, we ask that your blessing, your anointing will be upon us as we've given, oh God, to the work. We ask these blessings in the name of Christ, praying together as you taught us to pray. Let us now say it, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Father, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 Shake hands with somebody near to you. <laughs> near to you. <laughs> near, my God, to thee. Blessings. Blessings. Jesus, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, Jesus, I love you. And let us join in the reading of our worship psalter from Psalm 91. Our, Those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For the Lord will deliver you from the snare of the hunter and from the deadly pestilence and will cover you with his feathers. Under the Lord's wings you will find refuge. God's faithfulness will be our protective shield. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday, because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For God will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all 
your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because you love me, said the Lord, I will deliver you. I will protect you because you know my name. May God indeed add his blessing to the reading of this holy word. Amen and amen.
praise God. Well, aren't you glad to be at worship today? Yes. I'm glad to be at worship today. Good to see you. I was gone last week. Nobody missed me. And I hear you had a good sermon. God is good. The word of God is good, too. So today's meditation comes to us. Uh, from Luke chapter 16. We're going back to Luke. We were away last week, and so we didn't get to minister on Luke, but we're here, and so we will minister with Luke. Luke chapter 16. Will you stand with me while we read the narrative of the scripture text in the New Testament? There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And there named Lazarus covered him so. title of our meditation is Rich Man, Poor Man, Luke chapter 16, 19 through 22, actually 16, 1, a through 22, but we will, we will hit that in a minute, okay? Father, we want to thank you for the grace that you have given us, the power of the Holy Spirit that is poured upon our lives, your anointing, O oh God, that breaks every yoke, and we thank you for, well, just being in your presence, being able to worship. We thank you for the freedom we enjoy, and we pray for those, O oh God, who are in foreign lands whose freedom is taken away, whose country is ripped by war. We pray, God, for Ukraine this morning. We pray for Russia. We pray for the citizens there. And most of all, God, we pray for your church, that your church, Lord, may arise to the occasion to be what you called us to be, a people redeemed by your blood, sanctified and sharing your love with all those who will listen and all those who are in this world. We ask for grace and mercy upon us all. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. And as a point of reference this morning, I want to talk. You, you have seen the title of the sermon. Of course, I don't know how it appears to people on the marquee. I wonder if you could do a survey of that sometime. The last uh, Sunday that I preached, the title of the sermon was God Welcomes Sinners, and I thought to myself, well, somebody might get offended by that, because, you know, who wants to be called a sinner, even though we all are, <laughs> it's according to the scripture. And this sermon Sunday is Rich Man, Poor Man. I'm reminded of the television series, I think, uh, that had this show on it. It was not one of my uh, television uh, things to watch. It was not one of the shows that I watched. Uh, I was quite young at the time it came out, and it really didn't interest me. I'm more interested in, you know, Batman and Robin, <laughs> Flintstones, Bo Winkle. But however, um, the title resonates, Rich Man, Poor Man. So I want you to do me a favor this morning as we get started in the Word of the Lord. I want you to close your eyes just for a brief moment, and I want you to listen to the reading of the text. Let me read it for you. This is going to help your pastor to preach, okay? So bear with me. Just give me a second. Luke chapter 16, verses 1a, 19 through 20. Hear these words. Jesus said to his disciples, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores. He longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. 
Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. Verse 22, the poor man died, was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man died, or also died, and was buried. Let's hear that again so we get the picture in our mind. Then Jesus said to his disciples, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. We are people who believe in the Trinity, so let's read it one more time. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 16, verses 1, 8, 19 through 22. Then Jesus said to his disciples, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. You get the picture. Rich man, poor man. I think to myself this morning as we look at the text, we need to examine the text. Now, you know, you might find out that, well, I'm, I'm not like most preachers. And it took me a long time to find my voice in preaching. And I can preach. And I can preach my culture, too. I, I can do that. What I found now is that the word of God, well, there's all kinds of preachers to reach all kinds of kind of people. And so it's by, not by coincidence that you find yourself sitting in this audience today or listening online to listen to this preacher because God wants to say something through this preacher to you by way of the Holy Spirit. I trust this by way of the Holy Spirit because if you listen to me, you're going to be angry. In fact, you know, I mean, you might as well live by your own rules and your own wisdom. I mean, why well, live by G. Thomas's? Who was he? But we look at the scripture to discern what Jesus is saying. By the way, that is really what the Bible is. That's what the Bible is about. The Bible is about God's relationship with people and how he dealt with people and how they dealt with God. And when we read the scripture, what we find out is God is always dealing with his people, talking to his people, expressing himself to his people. And his people at times express themselves to God. I mean, can you read some of the Psalms of David uh, when he says to God, you know, God, get my enemies. Sometimes it's uh, what we call precatory prayers, you know, that, that kind of, you know, Kill them all. There's one psalm that even talks about taking their babies and, and, and dashing their heads against stone. And you think to myself, how cruel could that be? Well, look at the reality of life. Man is cruel. I mean, even children are cruel. You ever been on the playground with a child? You know, you fat. You know, my thing was I always went to school with a bald head because my mother was a barber. When she's going to barber school, we got a haircut every weekend. Mom had to practice, you know, and, hey, ball head, slapping me upside, I mean, even my brother slapped me upside my head. By the way, I don't take that stuff no more. Children are cruel. We live in a cruel society, and, and, and things in the scripture sometimes, well, they, they might even anger us because they seem so cruel, and when we read this story, we wonder why. Let us examine the text. The context of the text is this is a parable. 
uh, and, and we know a parable to be like a folk tale, the legend, you know, the the allegory, the 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 mere story of it. Uh, 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 and God is telling the story, but there's something about this 16th chapter that starts, and and, and 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 let's just examine it because Jesus starts off with telling the story in the 16th chapter of the two brothers and the father. You know, the son, the young son, who ran off with all his father's money, with his share of his inheritance. You, know, you remember that guy. We preached about that guy and, and how he, 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 he squandered it all and realized, you know, how he had sinned, by the way, against heaven. When we sin, we really sin against heaven. David prayed in the 51st Division of Psalms, forgive me for the sins that I've done. For against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Well, David, did you not, did you not have relationships with Uriah the Hittite's wife? And did you not plant and, and do conspiracy of murder to have him murdered so you could cover up your sin? Yeah. But who gave the commandment that thou should not commit adultery? That's God's commandment. And so when he prays in the 51st chapter of the division of some, the sins that I have given, the sins that I have committed, I have committed against God. And this is what that son thought within himself. I committed this sin. I, I, and Father, I'm going home and I'm going to say to my father, I've sinned against heaven. Also sinned against you, but mostly I sinned against heaven because you gave a commandment, God, to honor your mother and father, and I have failed to do that. And you remember the story how it plays out that they, the father sees him and runs to him and, and gives him the shoes and, and gives him the finest uh, 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 garment and, and puts the ring on his finger and says, hey, kill the fat calf. We're in a party. My son was dead. He's alive. He had gone away from me. Now he's back home. But the other brother, the older brother who stayed home and did the work, who was angry, and Jesus tells that story. And as he goes on to tell that story, he also tells the next story of the unjust or, or, or steward who, 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 who was questioned about his reality of how he kept his master's money. And, and somebody made the report, you know, somebody will report you. The proverb says, be careful when every man speaks well of you. So whoever calls the bishop, that's okay. Some people will report you. They reported him, and in the process, he had to come in, and his, his Lord says, give an account of yourself because you're not going to be steward anymore. And, and, and he tells how, how he, looked, he, he looked at it, and, oh, what, what, what am I going to do? Uh, you know, I, I'm not one of these guys. I don't be begging because I don't like to beg. You know, I got too much pride for that. And, and, you know, I'm not really one of those guys who's going to go ditch digging, so I'm not going to dig. What am I going to do? And so he calls all his, all, all, all his master's debtors that he is responsible for. He gets all those accounts, and he says, how much you owe my master? One says $100. He said, sit down quickly and write 50 he says to another, how much you owe? He said, I, you owe 100, right, 80. And, and he reduces their bill. And, and, and the narrative of the text, you know, I had, a, I had a hard time with this, but I had to go back and read the text because I, I read it first and I thought that Jesus rewarded him or said he was good for that, but that's not what the text says. The text says his Lord, in other words, his master said of him, you have done well, you have been shrewd. After all, most business people are shrewd. It's the art of the deal. <laughs> that just went over some people's head, but we're going to move on. In the process, his Lord says to them, you've done wise. And Jesus goes on and says to his disciples, he says, now here's what I'm going to tell you to learn from this story. Make friends of those who have mammon, of, of ungodly money. You think there's something? That's like making friends with the drug dealer, Jesus. I don't know if I want to be partner that. Well, you know what? The drug dealer needs some prayer. Oh, yes, he does. It's like making, making a deal with the pimp. Jesus, I don't really want to be a part of it. No, but he needs some prayer. And he needs to know when his wife gets in trouble, when he, when he gets to the place or she gets to the place where things are not going well, that, you know, the law is about to catch up with him and, and their enemies is about to catch up with him. They can call the preacher. They can call the church member. They can call the people of God and say, you know what, pray for me that God has mercy. Jesus says, make friends with those people. Of course, we in the church don't want to make friends with anybody who's not like us. And remember, Jesus ate with sinners. He welcomed sinners. He, 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 he hung out with them. In fact, if he hangs out, hangs out today in this church, <laughs> he hanging out with me. I'm like Paul. 
Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. I mean, in actuality, if you take Christ out of my life, what would happen to me? What would happen to you if you remove the Lord from your life? I was thinking this morning uh, 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 of, the, of the, 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 uh, the Psalter lesson, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, what a beautiful Psalter lesson. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my strength, my fortress, my God in whom I would trust. And I'm thinking to myself, where would I be if it hadn't been for the Lord? If you take Christ out of my life, if you take Christ out of your life, where would you be? I'm telling you something. I'd probably make the, uh, the drug dealer look like he was on a Sunday school picnic. Because of Jesus, transformation has happened. Life took a different trajectory. And Jesus is just telling these stories in the narrative of the text. And here to before, he, he, is, he has basically told parables using uh, natural illustrations to, ex, to, to explain spiritual things. But now it seems that the 16th chapter gets down to real nitty gritty. Because he goes on between verses 14 and 15 and he talks about to the Pharisees about their self-justification. By the way, he's talking to his disciples, but the Pharisees are listening in and they're chiding with Jesus because they don't believe a word he's saying. They're angry with him and Jesus talks about your self-justification. There's like two kinds of justification. There's a justification where we justify ourselves, you know, because some people think they stuff don't stink. I mean, you know. I don't want to be vulgar, but, you know, some people, you know, they leave, you know, the outhouse and no water on it, you know, like, this is not, you're not Picasso here. We, we're not making art forms here, okay? Everybody's stuff stink. In fact, all flesh is grass and all flesh smell alike. The reality of it is that some people are self-justified. You know, you can do this and you're wrong, 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 wrong. But if I do this, oh, oh, oh that's okay. They have self-justification, and, and, and they, Jesus tells them about God's justification. They're the things that, that are in the sight of man that are honorable, but the things they are abomination to God because God knows the heart. The reality of it, he knows what's in the heart of man. And then he goes on and he testifies to them about the dispensation of the law and the prophets concerning the law and the prophets and John the Baptist and how John the Baptist was a great man. But until man, before, the, before until John came, the law and the prophets were it. And, and basically Jesus says, since John, every man presses himself into the kingdom. In fact, he, the indication of the Greek word is that he violently presses himself into the kingdom. And they didn't understand really what Jesus got. Frankly, I didn't understand when I say until I looked it up. This, this, the essence is the picture you get. You, 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 you ever seen Black Friday and how the people camp out at the Walmart and when the doors open, they, they come in in a mad rush and they're about to beat each other up because they want that television? That, that, that new gadget, that, that toy for their kid. I mean, they are angry, they are violent. And the essence of the kingdom of God is what Jesus is saying. is like men who press into the kingdom, they get angry. They want to be there so much they want to be in God's kingdom. In fact, there is no other way to get into God's kingdom. You say, Pastor, are you preaching violence? No, I'm talking about the violence of the spirit in a man. There has to be a press. There has, there has to be a reality. And, and I thought on this, I thought on this, and I said to myself, my, what a reality there is. There must be a pressing into the kingdom of God. There must be a born-again experience. And you know, no child comes into this world without some pain. Amen, women? Pain! There must be a conception. You must hear the word of God and, and receive it into your heart. And, 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 and it, it must germinate, it must incubate, it must take some time. You see, a lot of people come to the altar. Yes, I gave my heart to Jesus, and they walked out the door and they never came back. Because there was no time of ingestion, gestation did not take place. And in the process of it not taking place, they didn't become fully matured Christians. Only Christian in name, They're not Christian in their soul, they're not Christian in their spirit. You see, when a baby is aborted, and I didn't come to preach on abortion, but when a baby is aborted, there's no life there. Before he's aborted, there's life there. 
I, I don't care what the Supreme Court says. I don't care what the politicians say. I don't care what the Bible says. God says, I knew you and formed you when you were in your mother's womb. I have known you all the time. I put you together. I sold you together. I know all your DNA. I know whether your nose is going to be flat, wide, or whether your ears are going to be large, whether you're going to be heavy set or skinny as a rail. I know all about you because I am God and you're my creation. Church, you missed a good time to say amen there. The reality is that that's a natural birth. And then there's a spiritual birth. Nicodemus comes to Jesus and says, how can a man be born again when he is old? And Jesus said, you, 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 we tell you natural things, but you don't even understand natural things to understand spiritual things. And he basically says to Nicodemus, don't even worry about it. Don't let your mind wander about it. Don't try to figure it out. You must be born again. You must have a new creation on you. The spirit of God must make contact with your spirit and create in you a new being. A new man, a new woman, a new child that becomes a child of God. Jesus says basically that until that time of the law and the prophets, people looked at the kingdom of God and they thought, you know, it would be great. I mean, maybe, yeah, he, he promised us a kingdom. And they're always looking from the natural. In fact, Jesus' his disciples were always looking from the natural. Will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? They asked Jesus before he left the earth. He says, it's not given to you the, the date of the time. Even Herod himself, a, a, a Pontius Pilate himself asked him, are you a king then? He said, my kingdom's not of this world. It, it is a spiritual kingdom. It is a kingdom that supersedes. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. You know why? Because the spirit never dies. The Spirit has power. The Spirit is life. Hallelujah. Jesus begins to testify of those things, and he, he moves through this, the essence of this, of this passage about the law and the prophets, and then he, he, brings, he brings this passage in. In verse 17 and 18, he talks about the law. He says, basically, this is the before the Before one little ounce of the law would fail, heaven and earth will pass away. People are saying, well, we, we're not under law, we're under grace. Yes, we are, but the law is still God's law. And he'll give you grace to live it out. Yeah, you say, I fall? Yeah, I fall all the time. Pastor Jones falls all the time. His tongue gets tired. His body gets tired. His mind wanders. Yes. And grace comes in and says, you're redeemed and you're forgiven. A righteous man falls seven times. But he gets up. And Jesus brings in this verse. L listen to this. He basically says uh, to those religious leaders listening to him uh, uh, concerning marriage and divorce. By the way, it's not divorce and marriage. It's marriage and divorce. you got to have a marriage before you can have a divorce. And Jesus basically saying that the one who marries and, and puts away his wife and, and she goes to another, you cause her to commit adultery. And the one who marries her commits adultery. And I know, I know some of us have failed on that. Thank God for grace. It, it, most of us don't get it right the first time. Most of us think that the essence of, uh, 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 of marrying that, that childhood sweetheart or the person who told you, oh, oh, I love you and I'll love you to the end. And, and six months down the line, sometimes six years down the line, sometimes 30 years down the line, that person, nope, don't love you no more. You love for decisions to make. And Jesus has this in the text. And I think to myself, why would, why would he even say that? Because... This chapter is about where the rubber hits the road, is about living life in reality. And so he tells this story. He moves forward to tell this story about a rich man and a poor man. I think the story, in essence, the truthness of the story comes out because he names the poor man. Now, now he doesn't name the rich man because, you know, uh, you could call somebody, well, you know, that's, that goes Elijah. But, you know, you really don't want to call somebody, well, there goes a Benedict Arnold. There goes a Pontius Pilate. There goes a Judas. There goes a Brutus. He, he, he doesn't give us the audacity that have that name. And the basicness of this is the, the essence of the rich. Let's, let's, let's examine this. Let's examine the text. The essence of the rich man and the poor man. Let's, listen to the text. If I can ever get the notes right. That's why I don't like 
Let's see if I have a right one. Page one becomes page three, page three becomes page five. Identifying the rich man. The rich man is identified, first of all, by his expensive, his expensive garments in purple. <laughs> And you must understand this. Our district superintendent in the North District sometime did a sermon. And, and, and uh, she did the sermon uh, throughout uh, uh, last year's uh, charge conferences. And it was so interesting to us as ministers in the congregation because what she said to us is that how they got purple, they had to get clamshells to get purple. And, and almost like a, a hundred to a thousand of them would give you an ounce. Of purple. He, she was talking about Lydia of the Old Testament, a woman and a seller of purple, what it would take to get purple out. It is the kind of work that we do. And so we don't understand that, but that is the kind of work that Lydia did. She was a missionary of heart. She was a woman of God. She got purple. And, and, and the essence of purple is royalty. And what we're trying to do as Christians is make disciples. We're trying to make royalty. And it takes a lot to get them royal. It takes a lot of clams to get, I mean, you know, the clam don't never want to open up. And you, you got to work with that thing. And, and this guy is walking around in garments of purple. I mean, I mean, Saks Fifth Avenue has nothing on him. J.C. Penney's, he don't even go there. Walmart, are you kidding? That guy's not, he is dressed in purple. And, and, and I, I, I'm looking at the text and I'm thinking to myself, fine linen, clothing, and daily, daily, he feasts. And, and so, this ain't no happy meal. You hear me? Th this is not a happy meal. This is not Wendy's or McDonald's. This, this is not even Applebee's or TGI Friday's or, or Red Lobster. This is more like an art doctor, like St. Elmo's or, 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 or Rick's Boathouse. Or Eagle's Nest or Ruth Chris. By the way, I, think, I, I don't even think I've been to any of those. I love her. <laughs> this, this guy, I mean, he feeds daily. And, and, and you imagine the people who are invited to dinner with him. I, I, mean, I mean, they come in looking sharp themselves and, you know, and, and they have this snob because at his gate, they're late. I mean, he's not standing there with a sign, help me. You know, I, I like the guy who's downtown Indianapolis who has the sign, you know, and, and a few years ago, we was having our, 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 our annual conference here and I was coming here with, with my first wife and we were coming in and, and she was a compassionate person. So everybody we meet on the street says, give me a dollar, give me a dollar. I said, babe, we can't give all these folks a dollar. We won't have any money. And then we ran into a man on the sign of the street. He says, it's for beer. I, I mean, he's honest. Hey, you know, he got a lot of money. <laughs> it's for beer. He didn't give you no heart. I'm a veteran down on my luck. He didn't give you. It's for beer. If you give me some money, I'm going to drink. It's for beer. But, but, but Lazarus is laid there. And the essence of Lazarus, listen, he, he, he is laid. By the way, Jesus gives him a name. He is laid there. It is obviously that he has some physical ailments and some daily needs. And, and, and he lays there at the rich man's gate, you know, and people are walking by and his company is coming in. And, of course, the rich man, like, you know, can the police move him? No, it's public street. He can be here. What, 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 what can he lay down somewhere else? Here is the narrative of the text. He's laid at the rich man's gates. And he's covered with sores. You ever been covered with sores? You ever known anybody covered with sores? You know when people break out with sores, things smell. You ever smelled somebody who has cancer? That, that, that can be a putrefying smell when those, when those sores begin to break out of him. He has sores. And his only friends of compassion is the dogs of the community. By the way, that most people didn't like not like we have our little dogs today and we, you know, we pamper them and we send them to the bed and, 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 and we give them, you know, blue, blue wilderness and all. I mean, no, these were animals, you know, go, get out of here, get, 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 get going. But they come to Lazarus and they lick his sores. His only compassionate friends are the dogs. And he has this desire. The narrative of the text says he wants to eat from the crumbs. I mean, you're talking dirt poor here. Not the leftovers. 
Not the stuff that they threw out in the dumpster that they did. Not the stuff that's two or three days old because they don't eat leftovers. He wants to eat from the crumb. His desire is just to eat from the crumb. And you would think that the rich man would have some lease, some audacity, even out of his pride to say, okay, come in and clean up the floor with your tongue. No, he doesn't. He is desirous to eat that and he doesn't get it. And I think to myself, pitied soul. What hopelessness and despair. Lazarus is, is alone in a world that is in a community that's full of people. He's hungry where there is food to be eaten. And I guarantee you there are, there are people in Speedway that can say that. I, I guarantee you there, there are people in your community that can say that. There, there are people all over this world that can say that. I mean, after all, America's a prosperous country, but there are people that are hungry. And you say, Pastor, well, well, well you know, some people are poor. Well, you, 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 you know, you might be right about that because here's the narrative of the biblical text. Here's what we understand about it. It is the Lord who makes rich and make poor. And people say, well, well then don't blame me. Well, Catch your breath. Because Proverbs also tells us that, that the man who deals with a slack hand, he become poor. And the man who is diligent, he becomes rich. The Bible tells us that, 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 that the poor is, 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 is owned by the borrower. The borrower is, is owned by the lender. The lender has all the power because we give him all that money and interest on the new truck. It is the essence of what we do in our society and we mistreat people because we can. The essence of the society is that, yes, God sets up the ranks. He, he brings up, he puts down, he will, he will prosper you or not prosper you. It, it, it really doesn't matter what state you're in. The fact of the matter is, and I think the reason why Jesus tells the story is that the end is verse 22, which is our key verse. The rich man died also. The poor man died and he was carried away into Abraham's bosom. And, the, and of course, we only read about four or five uh, verses out of the text. But if you go back and read the rest of the text, you'll find out that the rich man did not favor well. And it was not because he was rich he didn't favor well. It's because he was selfish. It's because he was arrogant. It's because he thought within himself, as God told to Israel, when you get into the land, when you be prosperous, don't say, I did it all myself. I made myself rich. I got this all by myself. I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps. Garbage. Because if God hadn't gave you the very breath to breathe, you wouldn't have been able to get out of bed. The reality of it is, is God gave you the strength and he had, gave you the business mind you had. You wouldn't have made a dime, not one dime, Mr. Uh, Buffett. The fact of the matter is that God has chosen you. And, and, and here's what the Bible says. By the way, ain't no harm in being poor. The Bible says in James, God has chosen the poor of this world rich in faith. Not the rich rich in faith like our televangelists teach us. Well, you got to have faith. And, 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 and I want you to send your seed, send your seed money. And, and, and don't misunderstand me that, yes, if you plant a seed, you get a harvest. But planting a seed in a ministry that's doing nothing but collecting seeds is not a good idea. And it's not good stewardship for the body of Christ. You missed a good time to say amen. It is not good stewardship for the body of Christ to be planting seeds in the people who want to dress in $1,000 suits and, and got more suits in their closet than they can wear in, in, in a matter of time and, and think that that's God's royalty and they want to drive a, 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 a Bentley or, or a Roy's Royce and they're pastoring a storefront church. That is not what God expects of us in stewardship. You are a Christian and you're responsible for your stewardship. Where you put your money is where your heart is. Oh, I'm preaching now if nobody says amen. amen. It's where you put your heart is. And your heart might, should not be in some bishop, some prophet, some, some person who wants to give you a word for today. You know what the Bible says? Freely you have received, freely give. I, I am charged, yes, you said, Pastor, well, we, we, we put you up in the house. Yes, you are. It's part of the contract. We're going to pay your salary too, Pastor. Yes, you are. 
It also tells me that don't muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. In other words, the laborer is worthy of his hire. And James, one, he warns the rich man. In fact, Paul writes to Timothy, he says, charge them that be rich in his world, that they do not trust in uncertain riches, that they do not act arrogantly, but they have this, this, this type of attitude, that they are gracious and giving, that they store up treasures in the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, when you put those treasures in the kingdom of God, the moss does not corrupt, the thief doesn't break in and steal, and I don't care what happens in the government, I don't care what the Federal Reserve do, when you have treasure in the kingdom of God there is no deflation there is no rising interest rate there is no market failure or, or Black Friday there is just prosperity because you put it in the right place you put it in the hand of God and in the hand of God it will prosper in the hand of a man you threw it away so if you're going to give give for the kingdom of God Give to the person or the preacher or the prophet or the missionary who's doing the work of Christ. The narrative of the story is, you're going to die. I'm going to die. I, I used to say to myself when I was younger, in, in my 20s, and, and, and my father-in-law would say, you know, now when I get to the place where I can't do for myself and I just want to go home, and be with Jesus and don't put me on life support. He, he had all these rules, and I, thought, and I stopped him one day. I said, you know what? Y your grandkids are going to need you. I'm going to need you. I'm your son-in-law. I need your advice. You're going to live a long time, man. I need you to tell me some things. I, I wish you quit saying that. He said, look, when Jesus calls my name, don't be messing around with me. Let me go. And then I got older. When Jesus calls my name, let me go. You say, Pastor, we, we do a lot to stay here. We do. We'll take chemotherapy. We'll take medicine. And nothing wrong with that. We'll go to the doctor. We'll be doing preventative things. We'll, we'll have hip replacement and knee replacement surgery. We, we can do all that. But when God says your breath is done, your breath is done. And Ecclesiastes said there's a war going on. The war is in essence that when you are in this body and your soul wants to leave, you can't leave till God lets you leave. And when it's time for you to leave, you can't stay because God says it's time for you to go. And Ecclesiastes says there's no discharge in this war. This war is constantly going on. I know sometimes I get close to God, I just want to take off. I mean, where's my chariot? It's Elijah had him. Paul says to the church, I want to leave. But it's needful that I stay. And we don't know why God keeps us here. You know, I, I, I've buried a lot of older Christians, and they, they oftentimes ask me, why did the Lord have me here? He took my husband, took my child. Why, why he still got me here? Well, and somebody said, well, your mansion ain't ready yet. <laughs> you might want to hang around. Uh, uh, Jesus, contract Jesus, you know, covering to Jesus. He ain't done with what he got for you. So keep doing the work. So well, I can't do nothing. I done got old. You know, the Bible says they shall bear fruit in their old age. I, I can't do much. You can pray. And, and the world needs a whole lot of prayer. You can encourage. And, and you can take your 50 cent offering and send it to Speedway United Methodist Church. <laughs> I just wanted to throw that in. The passage teaches us that Lazarus, he died. And the angels scooped him up. I, I like the King James with his prophetic lungs. They took him to be in the bosom of Abraham. You, ha you have to understand that. You know, you look at in the bosom. You know, you don't let anybody into your bosom. You, you don't, you know, you hold your sister dear like that, you know. One day, maybe you hold your pastor dear, okay. But you hold your sister dear. Your mother, you, you hold dear like that. You, 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 your child, you... You embrace that. I mean, you, your brother or sister. I mean, I see my brothers every night, and I, I just hug them. I'm not reminded of how many times they slapped me upside my head when I had that ball here. It really doesn't matter. You're my brother. I, I, I'm not even reminding myself of the cruel things that they said to me because I was the youngest. Or, 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 or the smallest piece of, you know, you get the chicken wing, you're the smallest, you get the wing. I, I remember, but I don't remind them of that. You're my brother. And I love you. And, and, and you might not know this about me, but there's, there's another side to my family, and, and mo most of which don't even acknowledge that I exist. But I still love you. Even if I have to love you at a distance. 
I still love you. The reality of it is, that's the kind of people you hold into your bosom. David was king in Israel after his sin with Bathsheba. And the prophet Nathan came to him and told him a story. He told David the story to get his attention. And David, with his righteous indignation, listened to the story and said that that man must pay. Here's the story that he told. He says, uh, uh, King, there was a man who had plenty of lambs, and, 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 and a friend of his came, and, and, and he didn't take his lamb. He took his neighbor's lamb. And his neighbor only had one lamb, and, and, and the lamb grew up with him and his children, and, and it, would, it would sleep in the bed with them. It, he'd take it, 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 it'd drink out of his cup, it'd eat out of his bowl, and he took that lamb into his bosom, and he loved that lamb. And, and, and that man took that man's only lamb and he slew it and dressed it for his company. And the king David said, that man must die. And the prophet said, you the man. You got all these wives and concubines and you ride a Hittite, had one wife and you took his lamb. The woman he put in his bosom, the woman he loved, you took it. And there's the essence of the story in Abraham. Abraham, he, he, he had this bosom. I hear the chimes. That means I got to quit. <laughs> Abraham has this bosom. Uh, he, he, Lazarus is carried into the bosom of Abraham. And, and, the, and, the, and the, the, the rich man, he, the narrative of the text goes on to say, he lifted up his eyes in hell and torment and fire. And in his humility... Don't wait to humble yourself. Just, just let me tell you that. Don't, don't do that. I can tell you another story, but I'll tell you later. But don't wait to humble yourself. In his humility, he says to Abraham, who sees him afar off, will you send Lazarus to dip his finger in some water that my tongue can be cooled in this place? This is the man who fed sumptuously. This is the man who had purple garments. This is the man who had servants at his beck and call and slouched a, a poor man who just wanted to eat the crumbs off the floor. He ignored. The tide can change. In business, they tell you, watch who you step on as you go up the ladder. Because the tide can change. My point this morning is not whether you're rich or poor. It's what you do with it. And if you happen to be poor, well, thank God for what you have. I guarantee you there's somebody poorer than you. In fact, by American standards, uh, Americans, uh, even those who are hungry, uh, uh, live better than most people in the face of the world. I, I, I feel real privileged, real, real blessed to be born in America. And if you're rich, as the church in Revelation, if you're rich and have need of nothing, and it, it, Jesus writes these words to the church through John, he said, you, you say you're rich and have need of nothing? He said, but you don't understand that you're poor, miserable, and blind. Proverbs puts it this way. It says, a person who, who, who says, I am rich and has nothing, and a person who has little and has great riches. What God has given us, he's given us. And we are to be good stewards of it. You might be a Lazarus. God forbid that you are the rich man who found himself on the bad end of eternity. Bow your heads with me this morning. Father, we thank you for the word of God that teaches us about you and your character, about who you are and how you deal with us and what you expect of us and how you desire us to love people and to love one another and to help, to extend a hand when we can and to be a blessing. God, that's the reason why you blessed us, to be a blessing. That's why you called Abraham because you call a man to be blessed and through him all the families of the earth, God, you said, will be blessed. Through this church, through this Speedway family, this community is blessed and will be blessed. And through the preaching of the word of God, these people will be blessed. I am blessed. God, may 
blessing. Your blessing not only extend in this place, but go beyond this place and beyond our borders and beyond our, 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 our geographical location. Go beyond, oh God, and do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask and think. Make us conscious stewards of the reality of living in this life and the decisions we make, how they affect our eternity. We ask it in the name of Christ. Give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, the, as the praise king comes to sing, if the word of God has spoken to you and you have not made a commitment to Christ, well, it's time to make that commitment. If you haven't had that born again experience, that that, that incubation process, that gestation process where the Spirit of God is connecting with you and, and you know the Spirit of God is connecting with you because he's pulling at you and tugging at you and, 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 you, and you know it. Well, Pastor Jones is here to lead you through that. And maybe you're a believer this morning and you are in this place and God has spoke to you through the Word of God and, and, and I just want you to know the altar is open for you. Spend as much time or as little time as you like, but I'm just letting you know. And if you're not a person to come to the altar, that's fine too, because God's all over the building. In fact, he's everywhere. But don't let it be tomorrow. Let it be today. And don't put it off while the Spirit of God is dealing with you and drawing you. Respond.
smiley face he knows father we pray over this blanket that she may sense your presence through it know that you are always with her that you will never leave her nor forsake her that you're there when she needs you most and even oh god when she feels that you're not there then you're carrying her when she can't see god your footprints and her footprints in the sand you're carrying her she's your child we speak a word of blessing over the blanket to be a blessing to her in Christ's name. He sees each tear that falls and hears me when I call. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Say it. He hears me when you ought to speak that to yourself. He hears me. He hears me when I call. Father, you hear the cry of your children. You know each of us by name. You are our creator and our God. You not only created us, but you created all of humanity. And you love all of humanity. And God, we know that you hear their cries. Even though they don't know. We know that you know, and you know their cries. I pray this morning for the spirit of grace and mercy over our world and over all that whom we come in contact with. May the grace of Christ, God, be prevalent in our lives. And may we exercise as stewards over what you have given us, rich or poor. You're the one who made us all. Be blessed, people of God, and go and walk in his strength and in his wisdom. Amen. Amen. 